Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to Good morning to all of you, great, precious, wonderful people. It is good to see you this morning. God bless. And Miss Sherry is up there by my sweet love. From me by coffee. I think I'm getting too familiar with the camera, don't you? I don't know. But I like being with you guys. And good morning, Miss Lena and Mr. Rick. I hope you guys have gotten some rest over the you know, from the weekend. I know it was devastating all weekend. But uh, we're praying for you. We love you. We love Colleen. Praying for her. There's my double B's. Brenda and Brett. God bless you. Yay! Love you. Love you. By the way, reminder, this is Tuesday morning, first Tuesday of the month, which makes it uh, Seeker Brunch. So you all come down. Let's sit around the table, enjoy the dinner, or er, uh, lunch, brunch, brunch, what, whatever it is that you eat. And we'll have a good time and fellowship together. Uh, it really is a good time. We've had some wonderful, wonderful times together. So come on down, Davidson's at 11 o'clock, and we'll meet together and have a good, good time. It's good to see y'all. Well, 
shall we jump in while folks are coming in? We'll just get the 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 tie-in together. We're in point two of uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. All right, looking at it and going ahead. And if I put that up there, that would help. Oh, there we go. Okay, so point two. Where does he take us? All right, we had just kind of opened that up yesterday, kind of started to peel it back. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, don't make a mistake, is this man, Jesus the Nazarene, Delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Leaves us off the hook. No. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. Put him to death. But God. And I tell you what. I don't know that there are maybe 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 two better words to look at is but God when God interjects himself I was thinking and just going over in my heart last night over and over over that that you know John 3 16 uh, Jesus it lays out the you know brazen serpent he says it's like he says but God so love the world wow this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David said, I saw the Lord always in my presence, and he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow my your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You make me full of gladness in your presence. Let's see, we had Terry come on. Yes. <laughs> see you at breakfast, I hope. Teresa, I'm glad you're better. Love you, girl. Daniel, good morning, everyone. Hope you all had a good day. It was a good day yesterday, yes. Mr. Daniel, you be careful. You give a big hug to that sweet family of yours. It is so good to have you plugged in with us in the morning. Well, you see, that's the message, isn't it? Uh, and, and that's really as we we uh, we go into what Peter's doing here. He's making this. He, he's showing us our message. What we have to proclaim to the world is simply Christ-centric. When we get off, Christ is the center of all things. That's when we usually get ourselves drifting down roads that we should not ought to go down. Right, Miss Stacy. Good morning, sweet girl. It's good to see you. She's not a girl anymore. I know she's a woman, but you know, you always see people the way they are, uh, you know, in your mind. And uh, she's one of my girls. She's one of the girls that uh, hung around our world. So uh, she'll always be my girl. Moving away from Joel, Peter moves to the focal point of his message and describes the life, ministry, and ministry of Jesus. His death, brutally. His burial, his resurrection. It's interesting to me that if you really look at the multitudes of topics and and messages throughout the Bible, how often and how many times, <laughs> wherever they go, they lead to the same place. They come back to Jesus. Maybe that's part of what Paul means when he writes the Ephesians. I shared this verse with you yesterday. He made known to us the mystery 
of his will. That will been hidden from them. It, it was always there. This is the thing that we have to understand about the word mysterion. It's not that it it just popped up. No, it's always been there, hidden in the shadows, just around the corner, hidden in the crevices, in the nuances, between the lines. It's always been there. This is a mystery known to us, the mystery of his will, according to God's kind intention, his kindness toward us, his full intent, which he purposed, where? In him. All of this comes through him. With a view of the administration suitable to the fullness of time. In other words, when he wraps all of this thing up, it is summing up all things in Christ. Things in heaven, things on earth. Paul simply embracing the goal toward the, which the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working through, the, through, through, through all of history from the beginning of time to the end, which is the fulfillment of the divine plan for all things to be ultimately united in Christ in the fullness of time. We're approaching that. The Apostle tells us that the Holy Trinity will set Jesus over all things at the time determined from all eternity. One day, all of creation, all of mankind, everything in heaven and earth, even the demon and all the devils, all of them, will acknowledge his reign and bow before him. At this point in history, Christ is indeed seated on the throne. Peter goes on, you know, as we look at this to attest to, here in Acts 2. For now, however, his reign is largely invisible. We have to admit that. The devil continues to rebel, and nations continue to honor his rightful sovereignty. Even those who are his chosen, Israel. Yet the trouble that ensues from this refusal to bow to Christ will not last forever. God appointed plan for his entirety of his creation, for the universe, is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, the very goal of creation is neither chaos nor disharmony, but unity. And the point of unity will be his anointed king, Jesus. So Peter goes to the very heart of all scripture and shows us the core truths concerning this Christ-centric message. And he exalts the man and he begins with the humanity of Christ and moves to the deity of Christ and then begins to unfold the plan, right? Describes the death of Jesus from both a human and a divine perspective. This man delivered over back one. This man delivered over for the by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So Peter emphasizes both the sovereignty of God and the moral accountability, the responsibility of man. Now Peter doesn't hesitate to join those two together. We have we 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 have this 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 problem in 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 our world in our theology. We we either have to be one way or the other. We have to either hang on to the sovereignty of God, which I do, or we have to put that off to the side, hang on to the uh, man's free will, moral accountability. When I not I, I believe in moral accountability, free will is one of those things that I have a problem with 
because if you are in bondage to sin, are you free? And the answer to that, no. A slave is not free. And Peter and Paul says that we are under the bondage of sin. Therefore, we are, you know, un, un, until we are saved, it is the believer that has his will released by Christ to make choices. Anyway, that's another, another lesson entirely. And I'm not going to chase that rabbit down that hole. But man is morally accountable to God. And that's what Peter's saying. God, this happened in God's predetermined plan, but you murdered him by the hands of, you know, so you have this moral accountability. These are twin truths. And I accept both of them. I may not fully understand it or the razor point on which they exist, but they are twin truths that may seem to be at odds with each other, but in reality, they are really, really great, great friends. And Miss Linda came on and Miss Linda said, uh, good morning all, I love the flowers and hearts. I will be able to join in uh, the fun breakfast. Yay! Oh, not, oh shoot, I missed the knot. I'm sorry, I'll miss you, girl. Much love to those who are present. June is still in Texas. Thank you for the update. Appreciate that. Let's pray. Father, you have just blessed us beyond measure. I can honestly say more. My heart is so full this morning. I sense your presence and your power the moving of your Holy Spirit God I live in such anticipation of what you are going to do and what you are doing and I don't want to miss one thing Lord I want to thank you for these that have given their time to this study I lift them before you and pray that God you will pour out the blessings of heaven all those wonderful spiritual resources upon them that they may be filled to the full with all the goodness of God bless our understanding today open it up and give us the wisdom that we so desperately need you've given it to us but the Lord bring it forth Illumine our heart and our mind. Help us to grasp your word. Make it a part of us, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. But before I go any further, I'd like to take one moment to give one example, I think, this morning that I think shows the beautiful synergy between the sovereignty of God and man's moral accountability. I think I'll have, answer a couple of questions you know, that has you know, come up uh, uh, of recent, uh, but this passage in Philippians 2, you've heard it, you've read it, you, you know it's, it's, it's an incredible passage. Uh, look at it closely at what it says. He says, so then, my beloved, he's writing to the church in Philippi, Paul is, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. In other words, you didn't do this just because I was there. Uh, no, you, you, you did it <laughs> all the time. But now much more in my presence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You see that? That speaks of our moral accountability. There's something I have to do. I have a choice. Am I going to labor and work out the salvation that God has put in me with fear, with trembling, or not. You see the choice I have to make? But now let's piggyback in on that. Verse 13, for it is God who is a work in you, 
both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here is the sovereign work of God. The sovereignty of God at work. He is working in us, filling us with the desire to grow, to mature, to hunger, to thirst after him. He gives that to us. But we must respond and work it out. God is out there sovereignly want us to show us great and mighty things that we have never known or seen. That's what he's doing. His sovereign work is out there working to show us. But we have a responsibility. Call upon the name of the Lord. And I will show you great and mighty things. Do you see how all of this fits together? God is sovereignly at work. But you and I have a moral responsibility to a sovereign God to respond to God's working, to his sovereignty. They go together. What about the lost? When the Spirit of God begins to move, and that grace is a, is available and, and faith is there. It, it, it's a part. Man, you know, as God moves, has a moral responsibility to respond. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The sovereign movement of God is to save. Moral accountability to man is to respond. Though God is sovereign, we are responsible and accountable. Back to the text. Peter has shown us the man and the plan, and then he moves on to the central teaching of the entire book of Acts, if not the entire New Testament, the resurrection. Peter tells the audience about the amazing things that God has done, but God... <laughs> raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it is impossible for him to be held in its power Jesus was raised death couldn't hold him and Peter explains what scripture predicted the Holy One would not see decay right Peter is literally expounding on David's psalm in Psalm 16 and answers the age-old question of the audience, is David speaking about himself or one who is yet to come? One greater than David, the greater son of David, the Messiah. So he points out that this prophecy remained unfulfilled in David but found its fulfillment in Jesus, who is the Christ. And this is important to us today. Just as important today as it was for them in that day. For without the resurrection, there is no salvation. Without the resurrection, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the resurrection, there is no salvation hope. This is Paul's message. In that great resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 as he writes to the church in Corinth, this is the message. Listen to this. Write it down. Open it up. Follow along. I'll skip from 13 and 14 down to 17 and 19. Listen, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching, my last 48 years is in vain. And your faith, worthless. For you're still 
you know, and then he, he, he jumps down to 17 and says, you're still in your sins. If Christ is not raised, your faith is worthless, you're still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most pitied. In other words, while everybody else out there having fun and, and, and going wild, we denied ourselves for a lie. We're most pitied. <laughs> but he is raised. And we are not pitied. After Peter expounds on the resurrection of Jesus, he follows up with the testimony of eyewitness reports. He says in verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. 120 that are there and even some of them in that, that crowd remember the credibility of the resurrection in scripture rests upon the multitude in part the multitude of eyewitnesses to this historic event Luke is writing out a historical documentary if you will the major point Peter is making is that a dead and buried Savior can save no one. But Jesus is not dead. He is risen. He is alive forevermore. And a risen Savior can and will save all who will come to him through simple faith. Which brings us back to the, 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 the last uh, major sub-point. In, in point two, he proclaims Christ is the Messiah. He takes all these events of Pentecost to Jesus' ascension, and then he quotes Psalms 110, going back to David, and applies it to Jesus. 34 and 35. It was not David who ascended into heaven. Here's the age of the question. Is David speaking of himself or somebody else? Peter answers it. It's not David. One, David didn't ascend into heaven. But he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord. You see this? A little play on words. The Lord said to my Lord, who's his Lord? The one greater than David. Who's the Lord? Elohim. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Jesus is exalted, ascended, sitting at the right hand of the Father, until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Jesus is King of Kings, and He is Lord of Lords. He is Sovereign. He is Messiah. He is the Messiah. <coughs> Excuse me. And He's has the right to rule in the heart and lives of mankind. The question is, is He ruling in mine and ruling in yours? Then, Peter moves on to point three, the concluding point, in Acts 2.36, when he says, Therefore, let me make application. Everything that I've given you out of Amos, prophecy is being fulfilled. We're in the last days. The Messiah has come. You crucified him. God raised him. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. He lives ever enthroned. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you and I I have to think he has to be looking at himself to crucify. Because Peter knew his sins put Jesus upon the cross. Peter didn't try to domesticate Jesus. He didn't try to soft pedal the gospel. 
He didn't go into the political chloric jargon of the day. He didn't dance around the issue. He says that Jesus is king. Therefore, people must submit to him. The supposition is that you will not submit to him, you will surely perish. Now later in Acts, in another sermon, he further amplifies his point when he and John are brought before the Sanhedrin and he preaches to them and he says, he is the stone which rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation to no one else, for there is no one other name under heaven that is given among men by which you must be saved. Believe in him and perish. That's your choices. Believe in him and live. Reject him and perish. Simple choice. Preacher, it can't be that simple. Surely there are shades of gray. You never see black and white. You, you always sees you never see shades of gray. You always see black and white. You show me black and white here. You show me gray, rather. Believe in him and live. Surrender to him and live. Reject him and his sovereignty over you. Fail to believe and perish. There's your only two choices. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came. But that the world through him might be saved. If you believe in him, you are saved. He goes on to say, if you don't, you are already under condemnation. Because he is Lord, because he is Messiah, we need to hear and heed the words spoken by David in that messianic psalm, Psalm chapter 2, verse 12. Submit to God's royal son. I like the NLT. I like the way it says it. Or he will be angry. He will be destroyed in the midst of your activities. For his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. We need to recover that holy awe of our resurrected, ascended Lord of glory, don't we? Sometimes I think we need to just turn all the sound off, and I do that. I do that at night sometimes. Especially if I, when, when everything is nice down here, it's warm, and I go out on the lower patio and the fountain is going, and, and, and I just want everything quiet. Because I just want to surround myself with the thoughts of God thoughts of the splendor of God, the wonder of God, the glory of God. There are verses through my head that, that, that lift him up, and I, I keep going back to this, but God, God, God. Until you feel like you're drowning, swallowed up in the wonder. Nights when I have trouble breathing. I have to, to leave bed and come down and, 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 and try to get my breathing under control and get it open. No sweeter time to spend. But to know that every breath relies on Him. We need desperately to recover that, 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 that all that that, 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 that wonder of the resurrected, ascended Lord of glory. Oh, his love has been so spurned. His purity so trampled upon, his truth so spurned. Buried, but one day, one day, this merciful Jesus will rule with an iron rod, I believe, covered with a velvet of love. And those powerful men that the world has ever known will hide in fear of him. But 
a little child, a, a person of simple faith. Come to him and surrender and be swallowed up in that loving embrace. And they need not fear. But rejoice because he's alive. And he gives life abundantly to all who come. Yeah. Let's take a look. Move on. Look at the response of, 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 of this crowd. In, in, in verse 37 through 41, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them. I mean, the, the, the invitation is happening. People are coming. They're, they're, they're getting saved. There are yeah, 120 people around there. They're counseling. They're doing all of that kind of stuff. And Peter's still preaching. He's still exhorting them, saying, Be saved from the presence of this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. Since I get the opportunity to worship at 3 in the morning, Amen. <laughs> Look, first of all, this crowd responds with, with with deep conviction. Folk, this isn't this isn't just hurt feelings. This just isn't regret. This is deep, heartfelt, crying out conviction. They ch they change their address. They go to all the way to brethren which shows their heart somewhere along here has begun to soften. It says they were pierced to the heart, which shows that their feelings of deep anguish as they realized that they were guilty of killing the Messiah. <laughs> Word of God is sharper. It's a scalpel short. It's that, that little dagger that is razor sharp that pierces and can go between the joint and the marrow, get between the bones and go to the, to the deepest recesses of the heart. The Holy Spirit stabbed them with conviction of their terrible sin. I think that's one of the things that are missing so much today. And so many of the, the uh, experiences, conversion experiences that people have is that deep, Soul sobbing, conviction. I'm a guilty, guilty sinner deserving of death. I don't have to tell you that, that I'm one of those folks that just kind of like Spurgeon. You know, there's, there's a couple of old guys out there, uh, Spurgeon and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Edwards and, and, and others. But Sir Spurgeon said, it is idle to attempt to heal those who are not wounded. To attempt to clothe those who have never been stripped. To make those rich who have never realized poverty. Can I repeat that? It is idle. He means it, it, it's, it's, it's fruitless work. It's an idle attempt. It brings nothing to attempt to heal those who are not wounded. To attempt to clothe those who have never been stripped. And to make those rich who have never realized their poverty. Oh, I know I've done some bad things, but I'm really not all that bad. Right? Have you ever heard that? out of anybody? I have. Well, I may have done some bad things, but I'm not like this guy. To attempt to, 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 to see a person healed from their, their sin and their rebellion when they don't see that they have a need because 
They're not as bad as the next guy next to them. You understand the cycle? The conviction of sin is often the missing note in all of our evangelistic efforts. We're a little too quick in trying to heal people who don't realize they're mortally wounded. We need... That's why God gives us his holy law to show sinners their desperate condition. Only after they feel that they should apply the promise of God's grace to the gospel is when they realize that they're hopeless without it. Now, I'm going to stop right here because we're, we're, the next point is going to take us a, a couple of minutes. And it says, you know, Peter applies the message of repentance, baptism, and promise. And we have to get into that. I have to give it time uh, to develop. And there's just not time this morning to do that. Isn't this great stuff, though? Have you ever really spent this much time, honestly, in Acts 2 on, on that sermon and seen what is there? Before we close, I want to do one little piece of housekeeping if I can. I hope to see you all at breakfast. Uh, I've been looking over uh, Friday will be 1,100 consecutive Bible studies. Haven't missed you know, a, a Monday through Friday in 1,100 days. That's, to me, quite a record. But I, I, I'm looking at, 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 at things going on in, in, well, I haven't, outside of taking you know, vacation, which we taped anytime I've gone away and ran and broadcast while we're gone, a day off in well since 2020 uh, except being down sick and I kind of say you understand what I'm saying I want to kind of take the opportunity to go see my great great granddaughters before they leave for Kentucky I haven't even, even held my newest great great granddaughter yet we're going up in July family reunion up there and we're going to be gone over weekend somebody will be preaching for me but, but uh, I like to get up and see her, see the kids before they're transferred. Okay. Uh, so Sherry and I have been praying. We've been talking about it, and I'm thinking that it's starting next week, not this week, but next week, uh, after we get past 1,100 days, that uh, Fridays I'm going to take off. I'm going to make it a day off, and hopefully, by the grace of God, at points I can go down and maybe float a fly stand on a river and maybe never catch anything but just get out in the air and, and float a fly uh, do some things that we've left undone but get in the car and drive up for you know a day leave Thursday night come back on Saturday and go up and see the kids hold that those two great granddaughters that I've got up there uh, before they leave for Kentucky because it'll be a while before we see them again. So, you know, if that meets with your approval, I, I told you I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, you know, but I am going to back off a day. If you find that acceptable to you, and I know you're gracious, and I know you'll be gracious, but these mean a lot to me, and I pray they mean a lot to you. But... uh, uh I really would like to do that. I haven't had my fishing pole out in four years. So I kind of like to do that. All right? So uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you. God, you are unbelievably spectacular. I thank you for the joy of, of diving in and swimming around in the deep water of your word. Now bless the hearts of all of these incredible, wonderful gorgeous people that you have given. Bless them and fill them and use them. God, let us walk around. I, 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 I still have in my mind you know, the, the very purpose that we 
you know, of, of, of Pentecost and all this, that, we, uh, that, that the whole earth be filled with the knowledge of your glory. That each one of us have that responsibility to go out in the space that we occupy, wherever we occupy it, whether it's Davidson's or our home or on the street or walking down the street, whatever, that we fill that space with the knowledge of the glory of God. May you be blessed, Lord, now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. You are precious and wonderful. And I will see many of you, I hope, at breakfast this morning. And then we will be out here at 9 tomorrow morning. We're going to pick up as Peter applies the message. You're going to see three things. He's going to talk about repentance. We're going to talk about baptism and the promise. God bless you. See you all later.